Hey everyone, welcome to another week of KNR 382. Uh, this week our topic is disability law, or more specifically the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the ADA. Um, our unit this week really picks up uh, on some of the content we've been looking at over the past few weeks in that it covers the same core legal concept, which is discrimination. So this law's primary goal is to eliminate discrimination against a particular group of Americans, in this case, Americans with disabilities. Um, so what I want us to do this week is really define what the ADA means in a legal framework, talk about the various segments of our society that have to comply, uh, specifically looking at which KNR facilities have to comply and, and how they might go about doing that. And then we'll look at how an actual lawsuit or claim might play out under the ADA. Uh, one thing to note is that of all the laws we've looked at so far this semester, this is probably the most recently passed law, um, as you'll see here in a moment. And you know, and what that means in a lot of ways is that businesses and even even our court system is still figuring out how to apply this law. So. Uh, as you'll note, it has changed and evolved even in the short time that it has been enacted. Okay, so just a very brief history lesson here in, in regards to disability laws in America. Um, you can see that really the first law that offered any kind of protection for people with disabilities in this country was in 1973. Um, so it's kind of crazy to think about that really prior to that point there were no protections legally for people with disabilities and in a lot of ways unfortunately those people were ostracized in our society. Um, so this Rehabilitation Act of 1973 is really the first law in the country to recognize that not only uh, are people with disabilities Americans but they had rights and they shouldn't be discriminated against because of that disability. Um, keep in mind this particular law was a bit limited in that it only covered uh, or applied to programs that received federally uh, or federal financial assistance. So basically, state actors like we looked at in our constitutional law unit. So while it was really uh, important because it started this movement, it also was very limited in scope in terms of who it protected. Um, after the passage of the Rehabilitation Act a few years later, we have another law passed, which is the Education for All Handicapped Children Act, which basically made it illegal for public schools to deny access to children with disabilities. Uh, again, prior to that point, nothing would really stop a public school from denying a student access to learning opportunities based on their disabilities. Um, so really this law set forth that all children should have access to public education regardless of disability. Um, and this really shifted the way our public school system operated in that it required them to then integrate those students uh, with disabilities into the classroom. Um, so both very important laws that were passed there in the 70s, um, but really, you know, we don't see sort of a huge movement on this issue until 1990 with the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, before we talk a little bit about the law and the legality, uh, I do just want to have you watch a quick video here uh, about the ADA. And, and this is a news report that aired uh, basically the week the law was passed. So it'll give you a little bit of context for of what was happening in the country and what their reaction was at the time. Three weeks ago, we celebrated our nation's Independence Day, and today we're here to rejoice in and celebrate another Independence Day, one that is long overdue, and with today's signing of the landmark Americans for Disabilities Act, every man, woman, and child with a disability can now pass through once closed doors into a bright new era of equality, independence, and freedom. And as I look around at all these joyous faces, I remember clearly how many years of dedicated commitment have gone into making this historic new Civil Rights Act a reality. It's been the work of a true coalition. Okay, uh, you can see there that was obviously at the time President George Bush uh, announcing that he had signed um, this law and again at the time it really was a landmark piece of legislation in that it provided 
really this comprehensive coverage and protection for people with disabilities that really had not been provided before, even in those other laws. So you can see the bill is actually passed in 1990, becomes law. It has been amended since. Um, and again, this goes back to what I said on the first slide and that the law itself has needed to evolve and adapt based on the way that businesses were dealing with this issue. So there have been some clarifications and amendments in the law um, throughout time since its passage. Uh, again, the overall purpose, as you saw in the video of this bill, is really just to end discrimination against individuals with disabilities. Uh, and again, to provide the first law that gave expansive coverage for those individuals with disabilities. Um, now, as we think about how this bill uh, applies to us in KNR, we can see that there are really two areas of coverage here. Uh, one is employment, so the ADA applies to employment and it applies to uh, the services that we provide as practitioners, so the access and participation of our members, of our users. So there's really two components here to ADA and how it applies to us as k &R practitioners. One refers to the hiring process and making accommodations for those with disabilities. The other uh, refers to the access and participation that we provide users. So we'll highlight issues related to both of these. Um, you might be thinking, why in particular do we spend a whole week on this one law? Well, the truth is that this law is extremely relevant to us in KNR, um, whether we're talking about a recreation or parks department, a medical facility, a high school, a college, a professional sports team, you name it, there have been a number of ADA lawsuits filed across our field. Um, so you can see here's just a, a handful of those headlines. Um, so this is not um, something that, you know, is that we can look past uh, as a field. It's something that's really important for you to be knowledgeable as a practitioner so that, again, hopefully you can avoid uh, finding yourself in one of these headlines. Um, so really our purpose today is to, to make sure that you're informed enough to do that. Okay, so what does the ADA do? Um, we can see here it, it does a couple of things. Uh, one, it requires all public uh, k &R organizations and some private, which we'll get to in a minute, uh, entities to make reasonable accommodations to remove barriers created by a personal or a person's disability. Again, this law is the most comprehensive law regarding disability in our history. Um, so because its coverage not only applies to public organizations but also private organizations. Um, okay, so let's first define what a disability is under the Americans with Disabilities Act. You can see here the actual definition in the law states that uh, a disability is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. Um, so you can see here that disabilities covered under the ADA don't just apply to obvious physical impairments or disabilities, right? There are a number of other uh, categories of disabilities that are protected under this law. Um, so it's not just a physical impairment. Let's say someone is missing a limb, it requires them to be in a wheelchair. Of course, that would be covered under the ADA, but there are also these non-visible uh, disabilities that are covered, mental um, disabilities, or even sensory disabilities. Someone loses their vision or their hearing. That's not something you can see or is obvious, but it is a, a, an impairment that substantially limits someone's uh, life in a major way. Um, so some of the other types of disabilities that are covered here, you can see um, disabilities related to mental or psychological uh, disorders, um, intellectual disabilities are covered under the ADA, so something like dyslexia or ADHD would be considered covered. Uh, like I mentioned before, sensory impairments, someone loses hearing, vision, um, and then again, there are some other non-visible disabilities that would be covered, so things like epilepsy or asthma. Um, those may not be obvious uh, disorders, but they certainly impact someone's uh, life and their ability to participate. <laughs> so you can see here that there is widespread coverage for disabilities under the ADA, and it's not just those uh, physical obvious disabilities, but also ones um, that are considered to be a mental impairment.
Um, now, another key component to this definition is the second part, right? That a disability is only one that substantially limits a major life activity. You might be thinking, what constitutes a major life activity? Well, let's think of some of the things that we do every day that are part of just living daily life, right? So getting up in the morning, getting out of bed, breathing, hearing, eating, sleeping, brushing our teeth, walking, standing, lifting something to get in the car, speaking, all of those things are what we would consider major life activities, right? Things that we have to do in order to get through the day. Um, you know, someone in a wheelchair would have a physical disability that limits their ability to walk, which we would consider a major life activity. Um, someone that suffers from dyslexia, uh, that which would be would consider a learning disability, limits their ability to read. We would consider this a major life activity. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so we were talking about how certain um, disabilities actually uh, limit a major life activity. And so we had mentioned, you know, if someone has um, dyslexia, that would be considered a learning disability, and that limits their ability to read, which would be considered a major life activity. Um, and then finally, if someone is deaf, uh, that would limit their ability to hear, which we would consider, obviously, a major life activity. So I think you probably get the idea here. Uh, in order for a disability to be covered under the ADA, it has to be either a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. Okay, so... In terms of the titles or areas of protection under the ADA, you can see here we have six different uh, titles. So employment, public services, public accommodations, telecommunications, and transportation. We're really going to focus on these first three, employment, public services, and public accommodations. Um, the other two aren't terribly relevant to what we do in k &R, so we're not going to spend any time on those, but we will highlight these first three. Okay, so Title I deals with employment um, and provides some guidelines to employers in regards to disability discrimination. So essentially, under Title I, it is illegal to discriminate against a disabled person in a workplace setting. Um, keep in mind, this applies uh, to both public uh, services and private employers with at least 15 employees. Um, you can see here that the unemployment rate for individuals with disabilities is generally much higher um, and has been much higher than those of the overall public. Um, and again, this is a problem and, and a concern, obviously, and it's gotten lower uh, since the inaction of the ADA, but there's still this gap in terms of employment rate for individuals with disabilities. So again, the ADA is really in place to try to eliminate that discrimination that might keep someone from entering and having a successful career in the workplace. Um, so essentially, the employment title here tells us that an employer cannot discriminate against someone who is qualified uh, for a job uh, who has a disability because of that disability. Um, so a qualified individual, what does that mean? Well, basically it means that they meet the key qualifications of the job uh, as long as they're provided a reasonable accommodation, okay? Um, so for example, if someone has all the education and certifications necessary, they have great experience, but they have a disability that um, they cannot be discriminated against because of that disability, so again, the goal for the organization should be to hire the most qualified person, regardless of whether or not they have to provide an accommodation. So what do we mean when we say an accommodation? Well, an accommodation is really just the process of adapting or adjusting uh, to someone or something. So that's making an adaption. Uh, and again, employers cannot discriminate against people who have a disability. Um, and in those cases that they do, they are required to make some kind of reasonable accommodation. Um, keep in mind that when we talk about uh, employment, we're referring to really all aspects of employment. So it's not just hiring, but also whether or not someone is fired, whether or not someone gets a promotion, whether or not someone gets a raise. All of these are aspects of employment that should be considered uh, under the employment title. Um, so as we think about the employment title through the lens of K&R, 
you know, once you are in positions of management where you're going through a hiring process, it's really important that you're aware of this particular title, right? That you are making employment decisions based on the qualifications of individuals and their ability to do that job and not any disability they may have. Again, it's required under law that you would make reasonable accommodations uh, for those individuals. Now you might be thinking, what constitutes a reasonable accommodation? Well, in order for uh, an accommodation to be deemed reasonable, it has to be two things. It has to be cost-effective and readily achievable. Well, what does that mean exactly? Well, in order for an accommodation to be cost-effective, it means it has to be affordable for the business based on their budget or financial status. Basically, it can't place undue hardship on the company, meaning it can't have a negative effect on their ability to sustain operations, right? Now, that might be different for every organization based on their budget, um, but essentially it has to be cost-effective for that particular organization. Readily achievable. So an accommodation that is readily achievable means that it can be completed without too much difficulty and is fairly easy to accomplish. So this component is really more about ease and time than it is financial ability. Um, so again, what is cost effective for a large uh, recreational facility might not be cost effective for a small locally owned fitness center, right? So these all are all varied based on the financial position of the organization. You know, what is cost effective for a professional sports franchise may not be cost effective for a high school, right? So keep in mind that it really does depend on the individual organization and a court would examine uh, the financial um, status of an organization. So a couple of employment examples of what might constitute a reasonable accommodation. So, you know, rendering a facility or equipment to be readily accessible or usable, purchasing adaptive equipment for an employee, these would all be things we would consider to be reasonable accommodations. Let me show you a few more here. So here's an example. If you hire an employee who's in a wheelchair, but let's say your facility has stairs that are required to go up in order to enter the facility, like this photo here. So I want you to think about what sort of accommodation you could provide that would be both readily achievable and cost effective, right? So, you know, it might be cost effective and readily achievable for this organization to put in a ramp, right? We're talking about a couple hundred dollars to install a ramp so that one of the stairways uh, has a uh, wheelchair accessibility. That's cost effective and it's fairly easy to do. So we would consider it to be relative or readily achievable, right? Now, let's say that in order for this person to work at the facility, their office is on the second floor, but there's not currently a, an elevator at this facility. Now, would it be cost effective and readily achievable for this company to uh, install an elevator? Maybe not, right? That would be a, quite a large expense and, and one that may not be readily achievable given the space. Um, so that would be one where you know, instead of building an elevator, that company might just have to provide an office space on a different level, right? A level that is accessible to that individual. So you can see here, you get the idea of what might be cost effective and readily achievable versus what might not be. Here's another example for you. What if an employee had a vision impairment that meant they just couldn't drive at night, right? They see okay during the day, but at night they have trouble seeing. So really the medical advice is that they shouldn't drive at night. You know, what sort of accommodation could you make to their work schedule to ensure they don't have to do so? Uh, and again, this would need to be something that is readily achievable and cost effective. So in theory, you know, it would be both readily achievable and cost effective to just make sure you schedule this employee during hours of daylight, right? It's not going to cost your company any extra money to do that, and it's fairly easy to do, right? It's readily achievable. Uh, one more example here. What if you had an employee who suffered from some form of dyslexia, so it was difficult for them to obtain long bursts of text and reading? So in order to be a new employee, though, you have to read the 300-page training manual. So what sorts of accommodations could you make so that they still get that information um, and that would be readily achievable and cost-effective? 
So it might be that you purchase some kind of listening device that allows them to, instead of reading the training manual, listen uh, through an audio book, right? That could be a way that you're not only providing an accommodation, but now it's one that's both cost-effective and readily achievable. So hopefully you get the idea here with some of these examples. Um, you know, in most cases, employers in our field can make accommodations that meet both of those requirements. Okay, one more thing here in terms of employment title one, and that's that, again, individuals with disabilities still have to be able to perform the essential functions of the job. Um, what are the essential functions of the job? Well, answering phones might be an essential job at a medical facility or a fitness center. Um, but what if someone has a hearing impairment? Again, a hearing assist program might be able to help them. That might be cost effective and readily achievable. You know, if they meet all the other job requirements, then an accommodation can be provided, then they cannot be discriminated against for this reason. So really, this is a two-part question, right? What are the essential functions of the job? Uh, and then can an accommodation be provided to help them perform those functions? So if you remember back to one of our very first cases in here, that was the Casey Martin versus PGA Tour case. This was where uh, Casey Martin, the professional golfer, had the hip disorder. And essentially, in order for him to play the 18 holes of golf, he needed to access a, a golf cart. Um, remember, the PGA Tour argued that walking the course was an essential function of the job of being a professional golfer, while Casey and his lawyers argued that providing him with a cart would still allow him to perform that function of getting from hole to hole. And actually, the court ended up agreeing with Casey. So um, even though he wasn't able to perform one of those uh, functions of the job, that accommodation made it possible for him to do so. So that's an important question that we have to ask as employers. Are there accommodations we can provide in order to assist these people in being able to perform the job? Now, there are some ex exceptions here, right? So if there is misconduct that occurs as a result of a disability, um, then those types of situations aren't necessarily protected or covered under Title I. Um, if the disability leads to frequent absences from work that ultimately impact that person's ability to do their job, that would also potentially be an exception. So there are some exceptions here um, that would protect an organization. Okay, so moving on to our second title here, which is public services. So shifting gears here a little bit. So Title II only applies to state and local government programs receiving federal financial assistance. So this is very similar to our state actors under constitutional law. So basically, the KNR organizations that would have to uh, comply under Title II are things like public park districts and recreational facilities, public parks, public schools, basically anything that met our state actor uh, requirement under constitutional law would also meet under Title II here. So with public services, what we're dealing with is issue of participation, right? So while Title I was all about employment access, Title II is all about access. Um, so it is illegal for these organizations to discriminate against someone based on their disability, um, to deny access to participate or deny services. So basically they have to provide accommodations if possible to allow that participation. Uh, now keep in mind those accommodations still have to be cost effective and readily achievable. So very similar to what uh, we mentioned on the employment title. Um, there are some exceptions here, right? So if making an accommodation to a participant would fundamentally alter the nature of the activity, uh, give you a, a good example of a real life case here that dealt with this. Um, there was a program that offered a ping pong tournament and one of the participants had a disability and had asked for the game to be changed so that instead of one bounce, this person would get two bounces. Um, now, as you can imagine, this would fundamentally change the activity itself, right? It would change the rules of that particular activity. So in those cases, uh, the organization would not have to provide an accommodation. So if the accommodation would fundamentally change or alter the nature of the activity. 
The other exception is if the accommodation would pose a direct threat to others. So if providing an accommodation to one individual would put others who are participating at risk, then that would be an exception, an acceptable one under court. I uh, uploaded an article for you to read on ReggieNet that deals with this exact issue. So this is actually a very local case uh, involving the IHSA where they argued recently that an accommodation would fundamentally alter the nature of an activity. So um, it's a, an interesting recent case here in the state uh, of Illinois. So I want you to take a look at that when you get a chance. All right, last title that we are going to look at is Title III. So this is public accommodations operated by private entities. So here we're looking at basically the same concept as Title II, but it covers private entities that open their doors to the public and requires them to allow access and make reasonable accommodations under the ADA. So basically here, any private organization uh, that opens its doors to the public it has to comply with Title III. So outside of KNR, this is really any private business that's open to the public, right? So any restaurant, hotel, movie theater, shopping mall, doctor's office, even though those all might be deemed private organizations, they still have to comply and provide accommodations because they are open to the public, right? They open their doors to the public. Um, so you can see here some of the uh, KNR facilities that might be covered under Title III or have to comply. Obviously, any private fitness facilities, medical facilities, rehab facilities, uh, any kind of university or high school that's private but still opens their doors to the public. And obviously, a big one here is professional sports teams, right? Those are private organizations, but they obviously open their doors to the public by having fans come um, to their sites. Um, again, same concepts here applying that applied in Title II in regards to making reasonable accommodations for those that want to access a facility. So, for example, a restaurant has to be willing to allow service dogs if a patron has a medical condition that requires it. Hotels have to offer wheelchair accessible rooms on the first floor of their building. Professional sports teams uh, have to provide accommodations to fans who attend the game. So you can see uh, the application looks very similar to what we looked at in Title II. Now we're just expanding that coverage to also include private entities. Okay, so you might be thinking... In terms of application, what does the ADA look like for existing versus um, new construction? So basically, because the law is passed in 1990, obviously we have a bunch of already existing facilities that don't meet the requirements under the ADA, right? So for those existing facilities, the law has basically said that organizations should do what they can to remove those barriers and improve accessibility. Uh, and again, it has to meet these two requirements, right? Those changes have to be both cost-effective and readily achievable. Um, so it's expected that organizations, even though they have existing older facilities, that they're still making changes over time to try to make those spaces more accessible. Um, but it's possible that we're still, you know, in 2019 um, experiencing facilities that aren't completely accessible, and that's because not making or making those changes is not always readily achievable and cost effective for organizations. So it does take time and it has taken a lot of places a long time um, to make these um, accommodations. Now for new construction, so basically anything that's built after 1990, uh, all of those architectural standards have to be met under the ADA. So there are some specific standards set under the ADA and any kind of new construction has to meet those, right? There's no excuse for not providing accessible facilities when you're building a new facility. So if you're ever involved in a construction project for your KNR site, this is going to be something that you'll have to be aware of. Now, an, a big question that often comes up and often came up, especially in recent years, is can a business impose extra charges on individuals with disabilities to help cover the costs of removing barriers or providing aids? Uh, and the answer is very much no. Um, the courts have said that it is illegal to charge patrons an extra cost to assist in removing barriers, right? Those costs have to fall on the facilities themselves, not the individuals with disabilities. Um, and the government 
recognizes that these things can be very um, straining to an organization to have to cover these costs. So they have built in some assistance through tax credits and tax deductions. So there are a couple of different uh, sections of the IRS code that allow organizations to not only deduct expenses that they put um, out there to make their facilities uh, accessible, but there are also some tax credits they can apply for. So there are some areas of assistance here um, from the government to try to, uh, you know, encourage these changes to be made. Okay, so how is the ADA enforced? Well, much like Title IX, um, the ADA enforcement process is very much complaint-driven, meaning that most of the lawsuits that we see uh, come from a private lawsuit, meaning that an individual feels they've been discriminated against under the ADA, they file a lawsuit against that organization in a civil suit. Um, again, if a person with a disability believes that they have been discriminated against, it really is in their best interest to bring this issue to a lawyer. Um, now, keep in mind that there are also disability rights organizations out there that have represented uh, individuals with disabilities who may not have the financial resources to hire a private lawyer. Um, the Department of Justice uh, and the specific commission, the USEEOC, which we've learned about before in some of our past laws, can also investigate claims uh, and file claims on behalf of plaintiffs. So you can see here that they've done a number of those over the past decade or so. Um, that have resulted in awards for plaintiffs. So there are resources for folks that aren't able to file lawsuits on their own, um, but you do still see a number of private lawsuits filed against organizations. Okay, so what does an ADA claim actually look like? What are the elements? Here we go. So plaintiff is going to have the burden of proof in these cases, much like most of the other legal issues we've looked at. Plaintiff has to be able to prove three elements in order to be successful in an ADA claim. First and foremost, they have to be able to prove that they are an individual with a disability that substantially limits a major life event. So basically, they just have to be able to prove that they actually have that disability, right? Um, and again, that goes back to our definition of disability under the ADA. It has to fit either a physical or mental disability, and it has to actually limit a major life activity. Second element, they have to prove that the disability is the sole reason for the exclusion. So whether the issue is that they didn't get a job that they applied for or they didn't get access to participate in a program, they have to be able to prove that the disability itself was the sole reason of exclusion and not something else. Right? So if a person with a disability applies for a job, they don't get that job, they have to be able to prove that the reason they didn't get it was the disability and not that they didn't have proper certifications or that there was a better applicant that got the job. Right? They have to be able to prove that the sole reason for the exclusion was the disability. Finally, a plaintiff would have to prove that no reasonable accommodation was made or attempted, right? So they would have to show that essentially the organization did nothing in order to try to make an accommodation, right? So that means they didn't even make an attempt. If they made an attempt and it was deemed to be not cost-effective or readily achievable, um, then that case would probably struggle to move forward. Um, but if they can show that no reasonable accommodation was made or attempted, they might have a good case under the ADA. Again, there are some acceptable defenses in an ADA claim. So if you're thinking about this from the perspective of, say, a K&R organization. So again, we already looked at two of these on previous slides, but if the accommodation would have fundamentally altered the nature of a job or activity, then you could argue that that's why. Um, you did not provide the accommodation. Again, if an individual posed a direct threat to the health and safety of others, this could certainly be used as an acceptable defense. Um, and then finally, if the accommodation is not deemed to be readily achievable or cost effective, this is probably the defense used most often um, in these cases. And, you know, again, we have many organizations in our field that, you know, struggle in terms of budget. So um, their ability to spend the money to make changes or 
you know, make adjustments isn't always there. So certainly arguing that making an accommodation is not cost effective or readily achievable is a common defense. Okay, so these are the three elements that a plaintiff would have to prove in order to be successful in an ADA claim. We'll get some practice applying these um, elements next week in class. Okay, so I did include here at the end of your lecture set some of the ADA requirements for new sports stadiums. So again, you'll find that as you look more and more into the ADA, there are some very specific requirements for different sectors of our industry. So there's a whole set of requirements for recreation facilities. There's a whole set of requirements for aquatic centers. There's a whole set of requirements for sports stadiums, which is I'm sharing with you now. So basically, these are requirements that people would have to follow if they're constructing new facilities under the ADA. So again, anything that's built today would need to uh, fulfill these requirements. Um, and again, these particular requirements deal with sports stadiums. So you can see some of the issues at hand here are seating. Things like at least 1% of the seating must be wheelchair seating. Um, and beyond that, the seating has to be uh, made an integral part of the seating plan, meaning you can't just put all the wheelchair seats in one area of the stadium. You have to spread them out and provide multiple viewpoints for those attendees. Um, there is a recent lawsuit against the Chicago Cubs involving a fan who sued after the stadium was reconstructed and some of the former uh, wheelchair seating uh, elements were removed. So take a look at that article. It's available on Regina if you want to read more about that case. Um, there are some other uh, components here to the ADA requirements on sports stadiums. I'm not going to get into too much detail on these, but you'll see that essentially there are requirements for each component of a stadium, right? It's not just the seating area, but also the concession area um, in terms of being able to actually view and listen to that game. There are some requirements in terms of providing assisted listening systems and visual alarms to fans that might have a sensory impairment. Um, so there's a lot of coverage here, um, you know, also issues related to the entrance of the facility, parking accessibility, all of these requirements would be included under the ADA requirements for new sports stadiums. Um, and I'll actually provide you with a copy um, of these requirements when we meet for class next week because I'm going to have you in your case study uh, do a little bit of examination of a case and, and really determine whether or not you think this stadium is fulfilling these requirements. So stay tuned. We'll look at these in a little bit more detail um, in class next week. Okay, uh, really quick summary here on our unit on the ADA. Again, I want you to take from this unit a couple of things in particular. I want to make sure that you understand the definition of a disability under the ADA um, and what exactly it implies for KNR organizations. Uh, I want you to be aware of those various titles and who has to comply uh, under those titles, you know, primarily those first three that we looked at today. Um, and then I want you to be aware of the ADA claim application. So what are those elements that have to be proven by a plaintiff in order to be successful in an ADA claim?